Hey, hey, all you Arizona lovers, this is the Finding Arizona podcast, episode number 403. I'm your host, Jose. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Today's episode is with my dear friend, Oleg. It's a new friend, and I have to encourage you guys to go check out everything that he has to offer. He's not only one of the founding members of the brokery, which is a local real estate agency, but it is his stepping platform into the world of being an author uh always ahead i encourage you guys to go check this book out and on top of that go check out the brokery if you haven't already know who they are it's getting bigger and bigger as the months go on but i've seen them and they're and their little whatever you call it when they post up in front of the houses that they sell uh the signs and it's just always encouraging to put a face to some of these businesses that you can just only see their logo or maybe just only have reference in the logo or a sign that you pass by it's always fun to put a face to that and a story as well this particular story is for those who are immigrants to this country who are settling in and looking for the american dream this is one of those stories I encourage you guys to take note and listen to. It was fantastic to sit down with him and it's even more fantastic that I can call him a friend and he's given us guidance on things that we want to do for the future of our home, but also has been very encouraging to go out and check out some of the brokeries local events that they put on. And we went to one. It's very, very exciting to go to and very exciting that we get to participate in those kind of things. I really do enjoy it. And actually, I have another event for you guys to check out, but I'm going to actually shift over to the businessy side. That being said, to say that we are available at fightingarizonapodcast.com. We make it easy for you guys to connect with us through social media under Fighting Arizona Podcast, everything that is social media wise. And if you want to send us an email, Fighting Arizona Podcast at gmail.com. In the recent months, we have been bombarded with you know inquiries and questions and things that we want uh to help you guys out with with like what you guys want to do with podcasting if you want to put on uh actual like recordings for content and other things of that manner we have a service arm now available for those who are looking and seeking that kind of guidance that is called the found house and i encourage you guys to go check that tab out in our website uh it is will lead you into our little spiel of like what we do as services for us and how much that might cost or even get you into the next steps of thinking about if you did want to do this these are the types of things that we can provide you and help you out with but i hope that you guys are encouraged to speak your truth Truth, to tell your story. That's what it's always been about is to give a voice to the voiceless or those who don't get a cheerleader on their side. That's what it's all about. We want to be the best kind of uh, encouragers that make sure that you guys feel like you've been heard. So that's all that is for. And I hope that we can work together. I hope we can uh, kind of come together and create different incredible pieces of work to that I would love to kind of reposition and tell you the event that I wanted to tell you in the beginning of this statement. And it's actually kind of revamping something that I've been putting on the back burner for a while. It is our community cork board. And that being said, I hope that you guys are encouraged to send us an email about some of the stuff that you love to see or love to do or even have coming up in the future. It is just a way for you guys to have free marketing, free advertisement in the small little portion of this intro. And that being said, I hope that you guys are encouraged to go check out our dear friends over at Das Photo House. It was so great to meet Claudia and get to know her story, but I hope that you guys will go out and check her out on First Friday. She is now going to do an exhibit over at the First Studio Gallery located at th uh, 631 North First Avenue in Phoenix. Again, on that First Friday from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. That is their opening and I hope that you guys will go check out. Art is so incredible. Artists around the Phoenix area are so incredible. And I'm glad that First Friday is able to encourage those artists and those painters, those gallery 
people to show off what they have going on. And I hope you guys go check out Claudia at this event. That being said, please send us a line at finding Arizona podcast at gmail.com to be a part of our community cork board. We will try and shout out as many of these little events going on in the future so that you guys can be heard and check out these local events. So let's just jump into this episode. This is episode number 403 with Oleg of the Brokery. I hope you guys will go check out his book, Always Ahead. And uh, I'll see you on the next one. Kisses, hugs, and belly rubs to our four-legged friends. Catch you later. Score big with SeatGeek. Whether it's concerts, sports, or live events, SeatGeek has you covered. Use code FINDINGARIZONA to get a fantastic $20 discount on your SeatGeek tickets. Catch your favorite live events hassle-free with extra savings. Visit SeatGeek.com and make every experience unforgettable. Welcome, everybody, to the Finding Arizona podcast. I'm your host, Jose, and as always, we bring in special guests every week. And today is no different, ladies and gentlemen. I am so excited to be standing in front of not only someone who is part of the real estate market and just a big name. I have to say, I've learned about you guys a while ago, and I noticed how many signs you have across the area on top of just understanding uh, that you guys put on community events and things like that. But now, even more recently, is a author. I would like to introduce you to Oleg here, who is one of the owners of The Brokery. Welcome, Oleg. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm very honored to be at a local podcast here in our backyard. Absolutely. And so uh, I will kind of give a little bit of an over overarching of like understanding like i've done my research a little bit sure and i've read up on on yourself here and uh it's been something of a great read for me to understand your story a little bit further um just from your family coming over sure. here in the 1980s and i won't i won't go too far into it. Sure. i would love to understand it and hear it from your perspective um so go ahead and give us a little bit of your origin story sure uh, i was born in ukraine in kiev yes uh in a 1975 and we were one of the last families out in the late 70s we made it just before they closed the border in 1980 so we came over as jewish immigrants yeah. uh settled in new jersey we're sponsored by uh, jewish family services out there i was about three my sister was six uh, my mom was 30 and, and my dad was 42 so we immigrated to the u.s my parents came this route to try to let us live the american dream and the uh, Man, am I living the dream for sure. Absolutely. Yes. Right? And so you were out in New Jersey, and I actually have a little bit of history out there. Well, a little bit close to it. I grew up for a period of time in Allentown. Oh, yeah. I know we're Allentown, PA. Yeah. And so New Jersey is a hot skid jump away. For sure. And, uh, being able to go in that area in particular is just very interesting and just a greenery, different environment, different kind of uh, mentality out there as well. I appreciate um, So I, I find it very interesting that, you know, your family coming from such a hardship and into this environment of the U S and something that I felt really interesting was your parents telling you that anything is possible and, and instilling that in, in you. hundred percent. I mean, it, the, the, the hardest journey was my parents, at the ages of 30 and 42, le- live it, leaving a country that's all they knew. They yeah. left their parents, their siblings, cousins behind. Culture. Culture. Going to New Jersey, not knowing a single person, not knowing the language, mm-hmm. not having a job. Yeah. So that is an unbelievable journey. Yeah. For me, being you know raised in America, obviously English was my second language. Mm-hmm. Um, all we spoke was Russian at the, at home at that time. Cause when we left, it was a Soviet union. Yeah. Um, th- this was like a no brainer. So if you bring over that cultural background of working hard, working five, six, seven days a week, whatever it takes to put food on the table yeah. and you bring it into an environment into the U S it's like, Oh my God, there's greenery, there's freedom, there's opportunities. It was amazing. On top of that, you add just the, you know, the East coast, hustle right you growing up in the east coast is very different than growing up in the midwest yeah or the west coast so you if you have the good work ethic and you're willing to learn the concepts of hustling working harder and harder the opportunities are absolutely endless here absolutely and i think that is very great to start off with and kind of 
um, etra, you know, inch our way into some of the other little bits of um, your your father was a metal worker. She metal mechanic. That's right. Metal mechanic. And then your mom was a seamstress. That's right. And also on top of that, they're taking all sorts of jobs from different you know areas and probably just trying to make ends meet and trying to really instill That's in right. you guys a, a deep work. Yeah, I mean, I, I got my first job as uh, delivering newspapers, if anyone remembers. That, that, was, that was still a job back then. Yeah. I think I was like 11 or 12, and I would have a, a, a newspaper route. And I remember on Fridays, I had to go collect the money for the newspapers, a little punch card. But that, that's how we grew up. My, my dad, I think when I was uh, five, six years old, was probably making a dollar an hour, you know, early 80s. And so he had a couple of jobs, and he would go to work at 6 o'clock in the morning but 10, 12 over time yeah. to try to make a little bit more for us. Um, and then for me, sports were important. Soccer was part of life. And I remember he would be out and, you know, working 10, 12 hours in a, in a, in a sheet metal mechanic and it would come out and still play soccer with me for an hour and a half. To, so, so when I have like a job like this, just yeah. showing beautiful homes or, you know, being the ability to talk with people. And then at nights, my son wants to play soccer. I'm like, and my father can do it after working 12, yeah. 10, 12 hours of physical <laughs> labor, I can definitely find the energy to put an extra hour or two at night with my... So there was a lot of things that my family, again, culturally-wise and, you know, very disciplined. Uh, the integrity was huge back then. Like, if you said you're going to do something, you do it. Yeah. Even if it cost you money, yeah. it was a bad deal for you. You still made a commitment to it. Yeah. I think a lot of the new generations miss that handshake. Yeah. Everything has to be on contracts and and everyone's always litigating. Back then, it was like, all right, I messed up. Let's just fix it. Yeah. So it was just a different environment. But I loved growing up on the East Coast. Also, you always knew where you stood. Mm-hmm. Your neighbor, if they didn't like you, you knew. And if they loved you, you, you knew. Yeah. yeah. You know, Absolutely. So, so moving out West, my wife is from here. She was born and raised. I was kind of a, another culture shock. So you go from the you know, Soviet Union to New Jersey. And you go from New Jersey to, we, we lived in Vegas for a few years. And the Atlanta Phoenix. I'm like, wow. Everybody's so nice, yeah, and they all invite you out, but they never want to go out. Like they're like, "Oh yeah, you know, let's go out," and then you don't hear from them for six months. Yeah, back east, if someone's like, "Hey, I don't like you," you're like, "Oh great, I got you." Right. Right. Or if they say we're we're having wine this Friday, you're having wine. So you always everyone just seems super authentic back east. Yeah. So moving from east coast to west coast was another cultural, again, like op- eye opener. Yeah. But I was able to adapt, and I I just absolutely love it out here. Yeah, it's a great I appreciate. Place. I mean, again, the understanding of like that trajectory of like where your where your environment involves you to actually start learning lessons about some of sure. the culture behind of where you're kind of living at. And you had brought up, you know, meeting your wife, and I actually read that you met her in um, uh, customs line. Customs, customs line. line. Yes, yes. And what was that kind of first meeting like? And and. It said that you pursued her for two years. That's right. That's right. So um, the story is really, uh, you know, our friends always say you can make a like a Hallmark movie out of it. Yeah. I mean, I'm a believer, obviously. I believe in God. Without him, I wouldn't be here, number one. But I was born as a Jewish kid in Ukraine, and uh, Ukraine is, historically has been an anti-Semitic country. Mm-hmm. But coming to America and then meeting my wife, um, I was 25. I was working for a pharmaceutical company, Abbott Labs, which was amazing in my life. My career has impacted me significantly. And our uh, awards trip was to the Cayman Islands. Her mom had an insurance agency, which they still have here in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, they had a program that was domiciled in the Cayman Islands. So every uh, year they had to go out there for a couple corporate meetings, you know, <laughs> um, so it was it was a, it was literally a you know blessing a, a path that was meant to in, intertwine. So I, I I lived in Jersey at the time. My flight was from Jersey from Newark to the Cayman Islands. They were based here. They they had a connection that, which I didn't realize was in Newark, and then from Newark to the Cayman Islands. So as we were entering, excuse me, the country into the Cayman Islands, we just started chatting in the Cayman Islands in the customs line. So she was there with her brother, her mom, and uh, we were just. You know, really talking, it was uh, 2000, say like 2000, 2001, uh, 2001, it was before 9 11. Okay. And our trip for the following year for Abbott was going to be Australia. Yeah. And, you know, your customs line and everyone's got the passports and they got these stamps and they were just raving like they just got back from Sydney and all this stuff. And I was like, 
It was just randomly, it's just small talk. Yes. And then that night, we um, I'm out with my buddy at a bar, and guess who's there? It's Jenny was at with her family is at the same bar. Nice. So again, you talk about faith and you know reasons of being in certain places, and we connected. She just finished her freshman year at NAU. I was I was already back east, and um, she had no interest of in moving east. And at that time, I had no interest in moving west because I had a house at the Jersey Shore. I was you know in my mid twenties. You had your life. thing going on. I did. I did. I was I was living the American dream. Yeah, continuing to live the dream. And uh, so we kept in touch uh, for about two two and a half years, and. I would always reach out to her and she's like, Hey, I'm dating somebody unless you're moving out West. I'm not <laughs> yeah. interested. And, uh, um, I got a job promotion and it landed me in Vegas. So Abbott relocated me a couple of years later. So after two and a half years of like calling her and nagging her, she <laughs> finally, she finally broke down. And when I moved out West, we started dating and nice. within a year we got married and Aww. this September we'll be celebrating 18 or 18 year anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. That's amazing. So super blessed. I've met my soulmate. I got, she gave me two beautiful kids. I got Levi and Lily. And uh, like I said, every day I wake up, I'm just blessed to be on this planet, able to live this beautiful life. Wow. It's it's so many things into one beautiful tapestry that is your life there. And it's just, I could pick at so many of it. And I want to <laughs> I wanna ask you, though, is um, you had brought up, you, you basically started in New Jersey and had your first investment home sure. in New Jersey in 1999. I believe. That's correct. Uh, and I know from just kind of your overall history, the idea of a place of home, sure, inter- interconnected, not only with, you know, immigrating here and, and being here and understanding what a, a household involves. And I also believe that the adage of like learning about certain quotes and and something along the lines of like uh your home is some uh the best investment is an actual real estate or a home sure do you believe that do you uh do you kind of see now where ha- having real estate as a part of your life has always been there yeah it's been a blessing you know so we you know growing up old school like my parents will not buy anything unless mm-hmm. they can pay it off or yeah they try to pay things off quickly yeah they, they didn't believe in leveraging and then after I graduated college, I had a degree in biology, bio-pre-med. I was going down a different path. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Okay. Yeah. Robert Kiyosaki, anybody who's in it. A big, a big time oh, book for God. those who are, you know, leaders in business and things like that. It was it was something that changed the trajectory of my life. Yeah. So I read the book, uh, you know, I, working for Abbott at that time. And um, and I, it, it really resonated with me that you had two paths. You had the, the this uh, Robert's friend's dad who was a professor great career um you know an amazing career and his father was like a blue collar guy yeah and he just started acquiring real estate and it it made so much sense so let's say you're working for a company and they pay you 80 grand mm-hmm. a year which sounds amazing and then you buy real estate it itself is growing yeah at the same time so w- w- even if you're not working on it it's putting money in your pocket so you're almost like working two jobs without having to work for a job. Yeah. So I was like, oh, that's cool. I can make money here and then I can buy a house for a hundred grand. And even if it grows three, four, five percent a year, yeah. 20, 30 years, maybe worth 200, 300. Yeah. You know? So I was like, wow. So if I had planted all these like seeds, seeds right? Yeah. So I've had all these houses by the time of 55 or 60, I've made whatever I made in my current career would be great. Pays for the food on the table, vacations. In 20, 30 years, I can retire and I have 50 seeds. Yeah. So I was like, oh my God, what a cool concept. I never thought of this because <laughs> my parents were old school. Like, if you don't pay cash, you can't buy it. Mm-hmm. I'm like, wait, I can get a loan? Like, it was just foreign to me. Yeah. So I had to understand the concept and it was one of the best concepts. And to this day, I'm a, my wife and I, we own a lot of real estate. I have a real estate uh, license here. Um, and, uh, about 10, 12, 12 years ago, when I got one of my first listings out here, um, I ran into a young gentleman who is a Marine. He's native here, talking to my business partner. He was acquiring a home for him and his wife. Yeah. And about literally after the transaction, three or four weeks later, we started a team in real estate. And we, we the core of us always believes that you should own a lot of real estate. Mm-hmm. Okay. And why is exactly like, say, even if you bought a home, I mean, you can't buy a home in Phoenix anymore for 200000 but even 
six, seven years ago when you, you could still buy something for 200000 Just think about it. No matter what career you had, if you were a physician making $200,000 a year or three hundred, or you're a, a CEO or working for a, a corporation at a local bank and making 60000 yeah. a year, if you bought something six years ago for 200000 that home now is worth four hundred grand. Oh, I know. <laughs> At least, right? Oh, I know. If you could even find something in this amazing market for four hundred, so all those years that you would make sixty, seventy thousand year after year, it's great. You're living your life. You're living today. That first investment now also brought another two hundred thousand cash in your pocket. Yeah. So, what that does, it's a life. It's literally a lifestyle change for everybody. Yeah. You have two choices when living. You could either be uh, a landlord, you know, you own, mm-hmm. or and you pay mortgage, or you could be a renter and you're paying somebody's mortgage off. That's the only way you can live, right? You either own or you're helping somebody become more wealthy. That's how that's how we got into the situation. We were still dating at the time, uh-huh. my wife and I, and we um, we were renting, and we we were just under that realization of like we're making someone else's payday right here. Like we yeah. live in this, we're living in a triplex. And at the time we were just like, we're just tired of giving someone else sure. our money. So let's go and try and find something together. Now that was the real kick in the butt for me to, to pop the question and right. say, Hey, look, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this. Do this. Uh, what? So, um, yeah, it was just one of those instances where I feel like what you just said was absolutely correct because we were at the point of like trying to find a home and it was around 200 to like the, just try to, sure. trying to get, just to get anything. Get, yeah. To get anything. It was, it was a hard battle. <laughs> and luckily we found something, but now, like you said, it's double its investment nope. over the years that we've lived there and I've seen it grow. And I'm also, because I'm a landscape architect, I realize why this place of Phoenix and sure. in general um, has become such a, a haven in real estate and has become more popular as the years have gone by. Yeah, I mean, you, you have people like me that grew up on the East Coast, right? You may have three, four months out of the year that are nice. Mm-hmm. Yep. Here, we have nine months out of the year. Nice. Yeah, yep. People from California are like, well, I live in Southern California. I get 12 months. Great, but you also pay 10X yep. of what I pay. Yep. So if, if I bought a home for 500000 you're paying 1.3 million and you're not making three times as much on salary. Yep. So those people from the East coast, the Midwest where it's cold and winters, where I re- I still remember growing up on the East coast and we literally had four seasons and it felt like each season was three months long. Like summer was three, yeah. spring was three, fall and winter. Now I call my mom in November winter hits and in April, she's like, oh, my God, we still got one more snow coming. So winter's now like six months. Yeah. Spring is like six weeks. Yeah. Summer, maybe three months. And fall is two months. So, like, the winters get longer. And our lifespan, like, it seems like as we get older, I can't believe quarter one's over already. Like, Yeah, that's what I was saying earlier. Can you believe, like, it's Easter Sunday. So yeah. April 1st in, like, two days. What happened to the first 90 days? So as we, as I get older... I want to spend every day I can in an environment that I just wake up and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe yeah. this is what I wake up to. Yeah. So why Phoenix is so attractive to so many people because it's still, we're, we're top five largest city in the country. Yeah. Our housing is affordable is the most affordable of the versus the other four housing markets, mm-hmm. right? Yep. So you compare to the California's, the LA's, the early, those prices are still, even Colorado, we're still more affordable than the next four or five big cities. And you wake up to this, sunny. It's just absolutely amazing. And people are, are friendly here. You know, we have, you like to hike, you go outside. Mm-hmm. You want sporting events, we have four sporting teams. Yep. You want art, we have it. We have Herberger, we have uh, ASU, Gab. I mean, yep. we, we have so much culture now. And then the restaurant scene in the last 10 or 12 years has grown. Oh my gosh! Gotcha. Oh, we know we've uh, we've uh, we've gotten the pleasure of meeting so many of those great you know chefs and owners of those restaurants, and just the realization of like it's endless possibilities, and it's only growing because 
as you start to see and understand kind of the environment and just people coming in and, and where they're coming from, they're bringing their culture and they're bringing where they've lived and experienced from and, and having to hone that in into a place where they call their own is only allowing the people who come from those places to gather at an exponential rate where it's like, you're, you, you know, this is a melting pot at its fullest. And so I really do appreciate living here. And I really appreciate that we have a home that we call our own. And I, I really, you're making me understand that uh, like, this is a great place to grow up and, and live sure. so far. And uh, I'd love to, love to get more of the brokery sure. and, and your partner as sure. well too. And you, you said that it took only like three weeks. Yeah. What made you say yes to him? And what, was it called the brokery when you guys first oh, started? So, good so I'm, uh, first of all, I, I love all the men and women that serve our country. Yeah. And they take the risks for our freedoms. So Tucker's a Marine. So to, to me, anyone who serves either police, fire, especially our soldiers, men and women, those are the freedoms they give to us. So when I met him and he was trying to acquire his first home for him and his wife and he was representing himself, I try to do everything I can to make it happen because he just got out of the Marines and he was back in the U S so, uh, his work ethic was amazing. He is 10 years younger than me. Um, but his work ethic, he, he responded all the time. He did what he said he was going to do. Yeah. Those are things you can't teach somebody at 25. Yep. You know, you can teach them as a kid, but as they get older, if, if someone's not motivated at 25, 28, I'm not going to start trying to, yeah. You know, coach somebody to yeah, yeah, yeah. either have it at that time or you don't. So those are the key things to our businesses. We, we say what we're going to do. We answer the phone. Um, and we love to teach people how to grow wealth. Right? You talk about acquiring homes. So even for you, I applaud you. I think what you did was a brilliant acquiring your first home. Here's the advice I'll give you as you continue growing your business and you know the, the whole local scene. Here. Yeah, of course. When you, I know you mentioned you have your first child. Hopefully, you have as many as you want. Maybe two, three, four. Maybe six. Maybe whatever it is. Right. Um, be, as you move on in your life, you need more home. Don't ever sell a piece of real estate you ever own. Okay. Number one advice: Don't ever sell a piece of real estate you ever own. So before you acquire the next one, if you don't have to sell, mm -hmm. buy your next home. Okay. Why? I'm the only realtor you ever meet who gets paid commission only when you sell a house that would advise you not to sell a house. Yeah. Right? <laughs> okay. Right? Why? Because if you want to accrue wealth, that is the best concept you can do. Because now you bought a home, your mortgage is probably very low, mm -hmm. yep. so you could easily put a renter in there yep. that's going to pay more than your mortgage, also give you some cash flow, which will help you acquire your next house. Yeah. And then before you know it, if you do this, and realtors do this quite a bit, is every two years, because every two years you can buy as a, as your primary residence technically or a first-time home buyer, you, you put less down because there's programs for that. But now two years later, you get another home, and then you have another kid, and you're like, oh, we need a, or we have two dogs, I need a bigger yard, so you acquire. And then the tenants are paying off all of your homes. Yeah. That makes total sense to so be on top. That is the best advice I could tell you as a realtor um, and as a little broker. But what Tucker, what was amazing about Tucker, he was a uh, he's a native. He's born and raised in Arcadia. Um, so this was his backyard. Yeah. Um, he, knew, I, he knew like the back of the thing. Yeah, he knew. He, he grew up on these streets. He, yeah. this, this is his neighborhood. I grew up. Um, I didn't know anybody, so I had to start fresh. But our our relationship has been absolutely amazing. He's. He loves marketing. He loves branding. And my background was sales and sales management and sure, pharmaceutical company. So the combination of marketing sales came together, which has really um, catapulted us to where we are. So at that time, I, we worked for our broker. It used to be called Biltmore Lifestyles Real Estate. Yeah. And our office was in the lobby of the Arizona Biltmore Hotel. Okay. So that's our first office, and we still have it to this day. After about three or four years, uh, well, after so we 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 signed up with uh, our broker for Belmont Lifestyles Real Estate, and about a year and a half later, we decided to create a, a brand with it or a team. So we yeah. created, came up with a team called the Suit. Nice. Um, I was from the East Coast, and I worked in pharmaceutical, so I was wore a suit. Yeah, Tucker was Mister Casual. He grew up in Arizona, flip flops, 
um, you know, polo shirts. And I said, look, Tucker, if that's the team name. You're going to have to start wearing, you're going to have to wear suits, bro. Like, you have to go to the store, buy some suits. Uh, and he's like, no, nah, I can do this. I was like, okay, sounds great. So we created a team called The Suits, yeah. which we didn't realize uh, there was a, a new show on USA at that time. Oh, the show. The, oh, no. the suit. Uh, so, and there were a bunch of lawyers, right? Yeah. So, uh, we didn't know. But was Everyone like, was like kind of thinking you guys were lawyers. lawyers or the suits. Uh, so, but we weren't. And it was funny because I, I, I always wore a suit. So even in the summertime when it's 110 or 115, yeah. people would come into our open houses and they're like, oh, like, are you wearing a suit? I'm like, yeah, I'm at work. Like, yeah. I just didn't know. But in Arizona, most people don't wear a suit when it's 80 degrees, let alone 120 degrees, degrees, right? Yeah. Uh, but that was uh, that's who we were, and for uh, so from 2011 till 2017, we worked for Cindy at Biltmore Lifestyles Real Estate. We then bought her out, mm-hmm. and we built. Then this building was originally uh, built from the ground up, and we opened up this office in Arcadia in 2000, April of 2017. So, a little in a couple of weeks, it's seven year anniversary for this oh, building. Um, so, we opened this one up. We still had one of the Biltmore. And then we started realizing more and more people want to join what we were creating. Yeah. A boutique brokerage, all focused on neighborhoods. Yeah. So if you go to California and uh, you go to La Jolla, anywhere, every corner, there's a real estate office. Here, the only place you saw real estate offices were corporate spaces hidden behind corporate walls. Yeah, yeah. And if you can remember back in 16 and 17, our market was still very soft. Everybody said brick and mortar was dead. No one's going to go shopping at shopping malls. Yeah. They looked at us like, are you really building a real estate office in the neighborhood? People thought when this was coming up, it was going to be another restaurant because you go to Ingo's, LGO. Like, oh, what's the next? Yeah, what's yeah. the next restaurant? Well, we buffed them all. And we said, no, it's going to be a real estate office. And we did. We opened up our first standalone office outside of the hotel. And then we opened up one in 2019 on 8th Street in Bethany Home. So we acquired it and kind of get in real estate. We say what we're going to do. So we tell people to buy real estate. We actually own our real estate. Most r- companies pay rent. Yeah, yeah. We actually own our, so we own this office. We own the one in North Central. Okay. Uh, we then bought one two years ago in Scottsdale yeah. at the base of Safari Drive. Uh, so the only one we actually don't own is the one in the Biltmore Hotel. We don't have $700 million. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What can you do? Yeah. What can you do? But so that's the only one we do rent. Everything else we own. And really and great. And as we open these up, we literally grow with the neighborhood. So we yeah. do client appreciation events here. Yeah. Uh, we do local markets. Oh. We help local vendors. We don't charge them. Uh, they sell salts and candles and whatever they do. Yeah. We try to help promote other small businesses. You, to the neighborhood. You allow yourself to be a part of that community and invest in that community as well. And so it, be, it allows you guys to just really reinvest yourselves into the, like you said, the different neighborhoods as a whole. It's correct. I mean, we, you know, look, we, we now have as much invested in the neighborhood as the homeowner. Yeah. Exactly. So my, when, when a neighbor calls and says, Hey, you know, I interviewed three other firms and they're trying to negotiate commissions. And all that. Look, no other firm has built a building in your neighborhood. Yeah. My job is to protect the value because I have val- I have skin in the game. Yeah. And you also have also this like longevity as they come and go, the people selling and moving sure. and they see you, they pass by you as they're going home every day. And, and it's, you know, it's still in their mind. When I move or if I need to move or, you know, oh, I see that they have this building over here. I'm going to go to them because I know that they know the area or they right. know that they are going to take care of me because I'm from there. Absolutely. So it's that kind of, and it takes time. Like, as you know, right. Yeah. You started a podcast yeah. years ago before <laughs> podcasts were even a podcast, yeah. right? It just takes time. And if you're patient and you're willing to go through the journey, the journey of your career, your life, whatever the journey is, and you keep, patience and persistence to it you can create whatever you want in the world i have so many things i want to go off of just what you told me here one uh to your partner there is a wonderful uh place to go get a suit the clothery which is a men's store oh. over at the biltmore that we've actually interviewed oh awesome they were really nice to us but on top of that 
that um, just how you guys approach everything and just being invested in not only the team members, sure. um, but also the community and neighborhoods as well is just so beautiful. Thank you. Now, what I'd like to also ask you too is just kind of the services that you guys provide. And we were talking about this in the car, my wife and I, is just when we first started looking for our homes and, you know, for our house, uh, we were new to it. We had zero, we were so panicky and so like, what do we do? Like, we've never done anything like this. This is, and this is one of our largest investments of our lives here. What can people expect if they, from you guys, especially in the pre, like thinking about selling my house or I'm thinking about buying a house and how they find you and what they can expect to come in and those set that makes you different from other real estate. It's a great, it's a great point. So what we've done is we created a true business. When you talk to an agent historically, they're one person and that person tries to be a great marketer, advertiser, a salesperson, answer the phone their own assistant doing paperwork. What we've done is we created an environment. We have 80 agents here and 80 among the four offices. So we have all little boutique offices that service the whole value. So for example, I have clients that will call me. Like I'm really, really strong on North Central. I know the Biltmore, I know Arcadia, parts of Scottsdale and PV. I know them very, very well. So, but I have clients that like, hey, my kids are moving and they're going to be moving in Chandler. What makes us so special is I have agents that live in Chandler yeah. and we always work as a group to help help service everybody among them. Like we have agents that live in Melrose District. We have agents that live in Coronado Historic District. So we have agents that live in the sub-market because Phoenix is very sub-market-ish. We're in the Melrose District. Right? Oh, Melrose District, yeah. right? So uh, Scott Reed is one of our agents and he's he's on the board at Melrose, like the uh, historic board and so we, when somebody needs to live in that area, I don't try to be an expert of the whole valley. But what I do say is we worked as a group and, oh, where you were looking for, I'm going to bring in Scott or, or Sherry or, or Jen, whoever it is. Like Arger, our branch manager in North Central, she's born and raised in North Central. Sam Levy's born and raised in North Central. So if, if I'm looking, if I have clients looking at that area, I will bring in another expert within. So you have two experts all the time helping you. Yeah. And why is that important? Because if I have five or six clients and you want to see a home tonight, and I'll be like, well, what do I do? Yeah. Right? But when you have a team working for each client, so you have more than one person focusing on your, on your family's needs, yeah. that's what differentiates us differently than anyone in the Valley. And we have a director of operations. She's absolutely amazing. In-house, we have a graphic designer. So we have we have experts that do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Because I'm not good at graphic design, but Jessica, a graphic designer, is incredible. We have assistants. We have a designated broker. So we have everyone that's supposed to do what they do, which allows me to be an expert of sub-markets. So when you're ready to buy or ready to sell, I can provide all the data for you that you need to make the educated decision. Awesome. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. And just kind of from a standpoint of what I read from your bio is just, one of those aspects that I really took away from it was um, you guys prioritize humanity over winning. And that was something that really stuck out to me. And I feel like from your dialogue that you've talked with me today, and just from my perspective of being at your events and things like that, you guys really do care and you guys really do try and make a difference. We do. We, we like, like this Saturday, we're doing uh, coffees and canines from 9 to 11 at our 840 East Bethany home office. And then next week, we're doing a client appreciation event. We usually do that once a quarter. So bring back all our clients. We're doing a big event at Life, Belmore Lifetime. So again, we support our local vendors. Mm-hmm. So instead of going out of state or something, we're going to do a party at a local restaurant, local event. So we keep the money back to the communities that have supported us with our growth as well. Really great. Really great stuff. But I do like to kick it towards the future and kind sure. of look at towards different things and what you what you may perceive from your expertise and one of them i want to quickly just dive into sure. the book itself here and give us a little bit of like was this something that was in your kind of like checklist of things i want to do and then wh- where did this come from yes so um i'm also a believer that i don't know if i have one day left on the planet or 50 years i wish i knew i don't think anybody of us knows <laughs> but that's i 
everyone knows how I feel. I have no idea. Yeah. So when I, before uh, we had our first son, Levi, okay. um, my wife was pregnant with Levi, I wanted to have like a memoir. If, if, for, if I were to die 13 years ago, my, my son would know a little bit about me. So I, I started this idea that I want to let my kids or my family to know my journey. So I hired a ghostwriter, paid a couple thousand bucks, about four, six weeks into it, I had like three pages done. I'm like, I can't do this. this is not, I got no work. <laughs> this project is way too big. The three pages. Is it like, wait, I imagine it's like that first entry into what you're trying to do here is just like, I don't think I have a, like a interesting life. And it's like, how am I going to pull all the writing together? Like I started typing and I'm like, this sounds repetitive. This is not going to work. No one's going to read this. So that book went on the, on, on the bookshelf at the three or four pages. And then, now I have two kids and um, I'm at a stage in my life that I love giving, like it's, I, I've been giving back. I've been on the uh, Fresh Start Women's Board for over eight years. Yeah. I'd love to give back to the neighborhood. Like I, I want to give back to other young people, people that are 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever stage of your life. So, so they can hear stories, other success stories that are not always the traditional path. Traditional path is, hey, you should be a doctor, you should be a lawyer, CPA, but I want to give it people stories of other entrepreneurs yeah. that had an event in their life that was something that made them go a different path, and they've had failures, but now their success is just amazing. You want to hear other people's stories. Kind of what you, we talked about briefly. I mean, you told me about you want to share stories. Like, it resonated. I got, like, chills, uh, you know, yeah. because it's the same. I, I, you know, we, we watch TV now. It's always negative. It's all this stuff. There's, there's so much more good yeah. that no one shares and people have to hear about it. Absolutely. So I come home and I'm like, Jenny, my wife, and I'm like, uh, you know, I've been thinking about this book and she, she's one of those, she pushes me to be a better person every day. Mm-hmm. And she says, well, I'm tired of hearing about this. You either do it or you don't do it. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Are you challenging me? I said, you know what? Fine. I'm going to go write this book. So. Um, I talked to, we have, we have an amazing PR gal, Elena, uh, who's, who's made this possible for, for us to be here today. And I said, Elena, I said, like, I'm interviewing some books. Some, I want to write a book. And yeah. I'm interviewing some ghostwriters. She has experience in this world as well. So awesome. she connected me with a couple people. I made some interviews. And then I found a, 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 this company called Best Publishing. And it was just the right fit for what I was looking for, to do. Yeah. So I... Went back east with my kids. It was last. It was two summers ago. We went back as a family. My wife had to get back early for work, so we jump on a plane. We're flying. We got my son Levi on his iPad. My daughter on her iPad. It's a five and a half hour flight. They're all entrenched in their movies that they download on probably on Netflix. And I'm like, well, what am I going to do? So I open up the laptop and I start typing. Yeah. In five hours, I had like 15 pages written. You go. I was like, oh my God, I got to start. I'm doing, I'm doing it. Like I got, I'm like, you know what? I, it's time for me to do it. Stop kicking the can down the road. I'm going to do it. So we came up, I came up with, I had this great gentleman from the company helping me out. Like, what are you trying to do? And I told him, I'm trying to get these stories out. So he said, well, what you, what you, it sounds like to me, you need to do it in an anthology. Mm-hmm. I had no idea what an anthology was. But when he told me the concept, I was like, that's exactly, because I still can't write 150 pages. Yeah. I can write a content concept of the book, but then if everyone puts 10 or 12 pages, yeah. then then it all comes to, again, it's the community. I try to bring a community together of successful people. I think that's what you do best. So it's like, that's something that you can definitely, like the concept of like, I am not the, the superhero. Totally. I am, I have. I'm a leader. Like I really do want to bring this team together of helping, you know, and whether that's through storytelling or through what you do here, it's, it's always going to be your greatest gift. Thank right you. There. Thank you. And, and that's how the book came together. Um, so I have uh, another great, incredible entrepreneur. So for you, you guys are restaurateurs here, right? You love your, the restaurant, the food scene. Um, Lauren Bailey is a super close friend of mine, uh, one of the owners of uh, Postino's Group. I was going to say, it's like, thank you. That name sounds so familiar. Yeah, so <laughs> I've known Lauren about 13, 14 years when she only had her first Postino's, which was this one here in Arcadia. Yeah. Now they have over 35 restaurants over five states. Wow. Um, she's just an 
unbelievable human being. Um, so she she wrote a chapter. Elena, my amazing PR um, woman, did an incredible job in her chapter. I have a couple of CEOs of pharmaceutical companies. That's where my background yeah. was in. Local lender. Um, so I have all these people, my uh, business coach, my performance coach. If, uh, so everyone has a story. Yeah. And all of these stories are absolutely amazing. So uh, I encourage you guys to get the book. It's uh, on Kindle. It's on Amazon. We just got international bestseller for a couple of categories and graduate countries. So it's really exciting. Um, I I have no idea where this is going to go, but I think stories need to be told. You're, you're, when you I created months. this concept over 10 years ago, and I think it's amazing what you're doing as well. Thank you very much, Oleg. I really do appreciate it. And I think this is something that um, I'm definitely going to enjoy myself and really take in as a entrepreneur and someone who loves storytelling. I think this is a great for, for me awesome. and also something I'm not very, I'm not a long winded reader kind of sure. person. So my wife is more of the <laughs> than I am, but I will also like to just kind of go into a little bit. One more last question before we end wrap up things is sure. what are you excited most about not only the brokery, but, the real estate market in general for sure. Phoenix. So what I'm most excited about is, again, we're the fifth largest city, but we're like the number one or two most desired city. Yeah. Well, like you, you take, we'll, we'll kind of put it in a perspective. This weekend, we, my family and I are going to try and uh, do the NCAA, oh. the events and stuff like that. Sure. We have the Olympics coming up soon and all throughout the United States. There's going to be, um, some future things coming down the road for Phoenix and just having and hosting different huge events that are sure. monumental to not only the U.S., but the world. Sure. You know, and so why I'm so bullish on this market, I really see is we, we, we no longer are just a tourist attraction. Yeah. We have so much industry now. We have Taiwanese semiconductor. I was going to bring that up as right? well. Yeah, they, industry. They're going to have over spend over $40 billion between phase one and phase two. Do you know how many high paying jobs that is? We need houses, right? They're either going to rent or they're going to own. So if you're an investor, you want to own as many homes around that area. <laughs> yeah, they need to live somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Intel, $20 billion expansion in the East Valley. You have d data centers here. You have uh, Google, more data centers in, near Mesa. There's Microsoft like, coming it, soon. It's warehouses everywhere. Yeah. Like, so. We have so much industry coming here mm -hmm. that it's no longer just like, oh, let me have a weekend for a bachelor party or a golf event. It's, yeah. I'm coming here for to live. Yeah. And as people come here and in the wintertime especially, they're like, I can live like this all the oh, time. I call my friends on the East Coast of Phil <laughs> when it's wintertime and I I indulge in the fact that they the, as soon as the FaceTime pops up and they have the misery of winter oh. on their face. <laughs> And I'm just like in my backyard, you know, with sunshine. Sure. It's like, how's it going? Right. It's like, they're like, where are you? I'm home. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. It's my backyard. So, <laughs> so we have all this beautiful industry. And what also it's great is when you have all this industry, you have more migrations. So I love the change of the the people that are coming here. You know, young, older, uh, all races, all religions. It's attracting everybody. Yeah. And I love that about what we're seeing here in Arizona, especially in North Phoenix and metro areas. That's awesome. I thank you for giving me a little bit of your time Pleasure. today. And I truly do think that you have something special, not only in your team here, but just in general, just who you are as an individual. Oh, I think you have a lot of things to give back to the community. And I look forward to going to more events that you guys put on. Sure. Hopefully later down the road, my fingers are crossed that we'll be able to invest more. And you will. I promise you, you will. I will hopefully uh, look to you for guidance and, and maybe ask, pop in and ask a couple of questions. Our doors are always open here at the brokery. We have four offices around the valley. Um, we Our phones are always on. So if you ever have any real estate questions, feel to reach out. That was going to be my oh, next yeah. thing. Go ahead right away and you could go ahead and uh, plug uh, phone numbers, sure. email address. All of them. All of them. All of them. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, my email at Oleg at the brokery com. Number is 602-402-2296. 602-402-2296. Uh, phones are always on. So if you have any questions in real estate, even if you want a good restaurant recommendation, a, a good shopping place, a good soup place, yeah. a good coffee shop, 
uh, we provide all that information as well. We are just, we're always blessed and always uh, appreciative of all the support we get from the community. Thank you very much. And we do have a little bit of an outro for ourselves. You should hear every episode of our podcast at FindingArizonaPodcast.com. All of our social media is under Finding Arizona Podcast. And last but not least, we always end every episode of our podcast with kisses, hugs, and belly rubs to our four-legged friends. And we will see you next time.